Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 211 of the NC DWI Guy podcast. On today's episode, I have my good friend Banks Huntley on the podcast. Banks is a former prosecutor and uh, really has some incredible insights into growing your practice. This is one of those episodes that before you start listening, hit the pause button and go get a pen and paper. This is an episode where Banks spent a lot of time, you can tell during the conversation, thinking through ahead of time how to provide value to you all, to the to the listener, and just has a series of things that have helped him grow his practice over the years. Um, an incredible laundry list. I took a lot of things away from this conversation. Uh, Banks is continuing our Young Leaders in the Criminal Defense Space series. Um, we did nine episodes and then uh, on episode 210, so episodes 201 to 209, um, we've done a series of uh, these conversations. 210 was kind of a reflection about my biggest takeaway from those first nine episodes in the series, and that was the emphasis that everybody had placed on the importance of relationships, and we are going to continue here for at least the next few episodes, this Young Leader series. T to me, if, if you are uh, either starting or intending on growing your practice, listening to how other criminal defense lawyers have done it in their own space is so valuable that the, the wide range of suggestions wisdom, advice that has been uh, carried through these last 10 episodes and here into these next few conversations has been really, to me, like just invaluable. I mean, it is just so important to be thinking about how to improve your processes, your client experience, your team. Um, and, and there has been some unbelievable reflections on how lawyers in the criminal defense world here in North Carolina have been able to grow their practice. If you are trying to improve your firm, if if you if you get into your office, walk into the office at the end of each day and you think to yourself, there is never enough time. There's never enough time to do all the things that I feel like I need to do and more importantly that I want to do. There's always this, this struggle of trying to find the time to do the things that bring us the most joy and probably the most valuable, the most value to our businesses, which is the kind of like highest priority pieces of our practice. You know, when you, when you walk into the office, I think, you know, th there can be that feeling of, I need to answer this laundry list of calls. I need to uh, reconcile the trust account. I need to uh, call back this marketing provider and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do and um, pay the bill on that front. I need to pay all of these other bills. I have to figure out, uh, you know, uh, my my office manager, my receptionist is leaving and I'm going to have to figure out how to place that person. And oh my gosh, they're actually leaving in three days and I haven't found anybody and it's going to take time to train. And we should, there's always this kind of playing uh, from behind feel in the small business realm. And so I think that one of the most valuable things that we can be doing as lawyers is learning from one another's mistakes, learning how other people in the criminal defense space have been able to find success find time to grow their practices, and then concentrate on the things that bring them the most joy. If that's being in court, then how do you spend more time 
being in court and less time answering phone calls, less time uh, working on bills, less time uploading documents, less time in uh, uh, office management, less time in trust account reconciliation. If you want to spend more time on the business of your practice, well, you know, how do I, how do I, uh, figure out how to manage my caseload? How can I maybe offload some of my caseload? The way that we get fulfillment in any line of work is by doing the things that bring us joy. And when you get into the office, when you, you know, have gone to three counties, you know, you've gone to your third county of the day, you've been answering phone calls between every single uh, county, you're texting during court, trying to follow up with people. There is this fire to put out. There's this angry client to call back. There's this bill that needs to get paid. Um, uh, oh my gosh, you know, I forgot that I've got this school thing at my kid's school today. And, you know, it's just one thing after the next. And then finally, uh, you know, you've done your uh, third consult of the of the day. You've called back the other three clients that needed a return phone call. You've paid the bill. You have um, uh, dusted off, dusted off the desk, so to speak, and sat down in that office chair. And you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I've got to gear up for this thing again tomorrow. If you want to have joy in your practice, if you want to love what you do, and this is true of anything, then you have to narrow down the, the pieces of your work, the aspects of your job that bring you the most joy. Generally speaking, those are also the things that you are best at because it's easy to be good at what you love. The best professional athletes, you can tell love what they do. At some point, it's not about the money. It's not about the status. It's I want to be the best that's ever played in this game. But you can tell that there is that joy in those particular athletes. And so generally speaking, the things that bring us the most joy are also what we're great at. And so how do we spend more of our time doing the things that we're great at and then figure out how to automate how to find somebody else to do, how to outsource the things that don't bring us as much joy. And that is complicated. That is complex, figuring out that problem. And the best way to do that is to get in a room with other criminal defense lawyers and bounce these ideas off of one another, to get into a book club, uh, a business book club, with other criminal defense lawyers figuring out how to run their practices better and bounce ideas off of one another. And that's what the Freedom Fighter Summit provides. So pitch before, before I turn the floor over to Banks, who is at last year's summit, uh, pitch to September 26th and 27th in Asheville. If you want to be around other lawyers and admin team members that are on fire about improving their businesses, the leadership within their firm, the culture of their business, their team uh, camaraderie, the experience that they provide to the client, the value that they bring in the courtroom, the value they bring in the community. If you are interested in those things, you should be at the Freedom Fighter Summit in September. If you are not interested in those things, you probably should not be listening to today's podcast. So, uh, th th because Banks is about to bring a tremendous amount of value on all of those issues. So, uh, with that, the floor is to my good friend Banks, who is clearly crushing it in business. Uh, so somebody that really has thought through how how to kind of eliminate from his to-do list, things that are not of greatest value or can be offloaded and how to really, uh, really take his practice to the next level. Really enjoyed this conversation with Banks, took a lot of value away from it, and I'm sure you're going to do the same. Banks, super excited to have you on the call. It's been fun getting to know you over the past year, year and a half, year plus 
uh, share, shared some very, uh, like running stories, a lot of mm -hmm. like case bouncing off of one another, and then got to spend a little bit of time together at the summit. So it's been fun getting to know you over the past uh, year and some change. And uh, thanks very much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with the audience. Yeah, uh, well, wisdom might be uh, might be a stretch, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you uh, having me on. Love the podcast. Have learned uh, learned a lot through it. So really uh, grateful to uh, to be here. Yeah, sa same. I I've learned a lot through it. That's why I keep doing it. Is uh, I'm, I'm learning <laughs> something every time I do one. So it's it's exactly. a blast. I really I really like doing the guest episodes. Um, but I, I guess kind of before we kind of dive in, we're, we're kind of continuing this um, young leaders of criminal defense series that we have been doing, kind of uh, people that are warriors in the courtroom. And so I guess kind of like going uh, a little bit further back to the kind of now uh, trial stage of things, what kind of got you down the path of law school and then into the world of criminal defense in the first place? Yeah, uh, so I was thinking about that, and I was like, God, my, my story is pretty lame. Um, <laughs> I was like, I, I wish I had something like, you know, my brother was wrongly accused, <laughs> and so I decided to, um, no, but but I went to uh, College of Charleston for um, undergrad. Um, originally thought, you know, I wanted to be a doctor, didn't, didn't realize that probably need to be pretty good at math and pretty good at science, <laughs> uh, which I was not. Um, so after about a year, um, I remember I was talking with one of my fraternity brothers and he was like, yeah, I'm you know, thinking about going to law school. And I was like, this guy, really? Um, and so I was like, well, you know, I'm pretty good at uh, political science and social studies and that sort of stuff. So I was like, and, you know, I, I think most people, um, consider, you know, being a lawyer pretty prestigious and, you know, you can uh, make a nice living from it. So I was like, you know, why, why don't I give this a shot? Um, so it took two years off before going to law school. Um, I did, I went to law school at Campbell. Um, I did what, there. What did you, uh, what'd you do during that, that two years off? What was the kind of gap? Um, so I stayed in Charleston a year, um, just kind of, you know, worked at restaurants, hotels, uh, there. Um, mm -hmm. and then I spent a winter in, um, Park City, Utah, um, skiing out there, uh, working for Marriott. And then I spent that summer in Key West, uh, Florida. Um, the girlfriend at the time, uh, her parents lived down there. And then I spent the next at least two years in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. So part That's of the awesome. U.S., Bowie's Creek. I, so. I know Josh Nielsen, who was just on the podcast a couple episodes back, was uh, big into, I think, both snowboarding and skiing, kind of like, you know, was was kind of deciding whether law school or kind of just, you know, stay stay in the kind right, of winter yeah. resort kind of side of things. So it's it's interesting to hear that. I do think that that like customer service background of working in restaurants and in the, you know, hotel industry, you know, for me personally, I got to um, bus tables for uh, about a year and then became a a waiter at the same country club that I was bussing tables. And it was a great opportunity to like, just work with people one-on-one, -on -one. you know, like I kind mm -hmm. of saw myself as like a entertainer more than a waiter. It's like the, you know, this, it was great because the, the country club that I worked at, they basically had like a standard menu every night and everybody had already like prepaid for their meals. So there was like, they, you didn't deliver a bill to the, mm -hmm. to the people. There was like four options to choose from. So not like the real professional restaurant, you know, uh, service people that are, uh -huh. you know, remembering all, you know, remembering all these specials that we have and different taps that we have. It was like very easy work. So it's just like, I, I kind of just saw it as like, I'm just here to like make people have a little bit of a like fun time at the end of their golfing day. And mm -hmm. it was a real, a real opportunity. I feel like to kind of get that service model background that, you know, to me, 
in a lot of ways is is some sometimes lacking in terms of the you know law school model and if you don't have any like business or marketing or customer service background in undergraduate which I did not it was philosophy you know so there was literally no real life like uh, uh or, or school replacement that you know kind of what was what the real life side of things brought in so I, I think that a lot of times those type of you know positions really do help with what we do yeah so so I actually worked for um a timeshare company in part there you city. Go. Yeah. And so like so, so easy, not an easy, not an easy sell, right? <laughs> well, not easy, but you know, like for you know, DWIs or speeding tickets, even if you don't want to sign up with me, you're gonna yeah. sign up with me. You know, <laughs> like That's awesome. you know, what we'll, you know, we'll we'll give you two nights at uh, you know, the this resort in Greenville, South Carolina, come yeah. listen to my DWI presentation. <laughs> uh yeah, have you seen that South Park? They came out with the uh, the timeshares, you know, they're going no, on this, no, like, no, I miss that. They were going on this vacation, you know, a ski vacation. And like, you know, they try to leave the timeshare presentation, take the ski lift up, and it ends up back in the timeshare. You know, <laughs> like they can't get rid of. Um, I, re- I remember <laughs> That's awesome. my, my dad was telling me, uh, he and my mom went on one of those presentations for like, a timeshare and you know they got like a gift card to a restaurant or something like that and before they went in there you know my dad was like we're not getting one of these right my mom's like yeah yeah we're just going for a gift card my dad said at the end of the presentation my mom was like i think it sounds like a good idea we should get one my dad's like (laughs) what are you talking about (laughs) so i mean uh that that sales yeah um training that definitely uh you know has paid off yeah uh in kind of in, in what we well, do. Well, so. I think that one thing that, you know, timeshares do a good job on selling. And I think, you know, some, some companies do a good job in terms of delivering others, maybe lack on the delivery, but in terms of the timeshare pitch, I think the whole model behind it is communicate more value than what somebody is going to pay. Right. Like that's the mm-hmm. entire mindset of it, like, make it stupid to not sign up. Like, <laughs> right. yeah. I think that, that that's, uh, what's his name? Alex Hermosi kind of talks mm-hmm. about like good, you know, how to make a good offer. And it's basically like make an offer that is, it, it, it'd be stupid to say no to or so, something right. along yeah. those lines. And, you know, I think that the timeshare model really has that down. And again, I think sometimes there's actual like delivery in terms of if you travel a lot or you like going to different mm-hmm. you know, places, there is a, a lot of real value in it. But definitely in the pitch, it's like you got to communicate that value. And, you know, no matter how great you are in the courtroom and all the motions and, you know, a detailed knowledge that you have about a DWI case, if you're not communicating that in the consultation, you're not going to get hired. Like there's not mm-hmm. a way to uh, kind of get that second bite at the apple with a client. It's all first impression. And, you know, you got to communicate. This is, this is, uh, I'm going to bring a lot of value to the. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're a great attorney, but you know, the clients don't know it, they're not going to, not going to sign up. So. Right. Right. Well, in terms of, yeah, so I, I think I kind of cut, cut you off there in terms of the, the law school uh, journey and then and then what kind of got into criminal defense. You, you kind of, I think we're, you know, got to got to Campbell and then what what led like in law school? What kind of was that where you shifted in criminal defense or was it after law school? What did that look like? <laughs> yeah. You know, when you're, when you're in law school, you have no idea what the practice of law is. You know, you're like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be a civil litigator. You don't know what that is. <laughs> no. I, I mean, I had no idea. I've so, seen the TV shows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've seen, uh, um, what's, uh, suits. Suits, is, yeah. The, yeah, suits uh, yeah. is the big one now. Yeah. It's great. Um, I love it. Yeah. I, I had to quit watching suits. I was like, how many, you know, episodes are in this season? It was like, you know, 16 and like 10 <laughs> seasons i was like yeah. this would be like a full-time job so I yeah yeah kind of i think i think that. i did but, the same after about season three but it was wildly entertaining so yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah um but yeah so um law school um actually my second year i interned at the da's office in mecklenburg uh liked uh, like that experience um but after law school i took a job um 
with doing civil litigation in Winston-Salem. Um, didn't really know it, it was a solo attorney. Um, and I'd kind of asked um, some other attorneys I knew uh, or that, you know, were family friends, kind of, what is this guy like? Uh, you know, one of the guys was like, uh, I, I, you know, he's not that great. The other guy was like, he's okay. You know, so I realize now, okay, in lawyer speak means this guy sucks. <laughs> so, so I went and worked for this guy for about a month and a half. Um, and I was like, is this what, you know, practicing law is supposed to be like, you know, I'd be like, how do I do this? He'd be like, you know, figure it out. And I'm yeah. right out of law school. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to do anything. So, um, Left there about uh, after a month and a half, um, and I ended up taking a job at the uh, DA's office in Stanley County. So back then it was Prosecutorial District 20A, I think, which was Stanley, Richmond, and Anson counties. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I it's funny how stuff works out because I almost didn't even make the interview. So... Um, you know, it's three judicial districts. I get, you know, the interview, interview, they're like, come to, you know, 801 Main Street. I'm assuming, you know, I'm driving to 801 Main Street in Albemarle, which is a uh, county seat of Stanley County, no courthouse anywhere. So I'm asking people like, where's the courthouse here? They're like, you know, it's a mile down that way. <clears throat> so I get there, you know, I'm already 15 minutes late. So not starting off good. They're like, actually, the interviews in Rockingham in Richmond County, that, that's where the DA is today. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so at this point, you know, it's going to take me an hour to get there. So at this point, I'm going to be like an hour and a half late. So I'm like, should I just call them and tell them, like, I'm going home? Like, clearly, yeah. I'm not going to get this job. Like, this is horrible. But I ended up going and uh, getting the job and ended up working there for five years or approximately five years. Um, you know, great first job. Uh, love the people I worked with. Uh, learned so much there um, and got to meet, you know, just tons of people. So the attorneys in Stanley County, all the clerks, um, all the attorneys in Anson County, you know, the clerks there, same with Richmond County. Um, so just got to meet tons of people. Um, you know, the advantages in working um, in one of these smaller counties is you get to move up the chain pretty quickly. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, so so true. You know, started out in, in district court, um, but then after about, you know, seven or eight months, I was in Superior Court handling felonies. Um, you know, by I think third or fourth year, you know, I got to do a murder case. So, um, you know, you're able to, to move up quickly. Um, and I would definitely recommend, you know, I think most people want to go work in, you know, Mecklenburg or Wake or, you know, some of the bigger counties yes. um, as prosecutors. But there, there's definitely a, a real advantage um, in, you know, working in some of these smaller counties. Yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's a generalization, but I definitely see, you know, a lot more discretion with, DAs that are in those smaller counties, you get to call the shots a lot more because there's nobody else to answer to. It's like, you've got mm -hmm. to handle the docket. There's nobody that you can sometimes tap on the shoulder or so. And then I also just think that generally speaking, the DA of those, you know, smaller judicial districts is basically like, I've got to give my ADAs freedom. Otherwise stuff is not going to get moved. Like we've got to get, you know, cases, push out the door. And so, yeah. And the bigger counties that I've practiced in, it's always like people are like pointing fingers and it's like, this mm -hmm. is the policy. You can go talk to that person or like, you know, I won't do that, but you can go over here. And it's like, I need to know who the, who's the decision maker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, when, when I started at the DA's office, I got trained by the head assistant and he was, you know, the one making the rules to complete rule follower. So I was the guy you would like, that I would now avoid in traffic court, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's like, yeah, you know, he had an IE two years, 11 months ago. You know, yeah. we got to wait another month before we can give it to you. Yeah. you know, so yeah. I was like the rule follower. Yeah. Uh, that like, you know, I know the defense attorneys are like, oh God, this guy is such a pain. But, <laughs> you know, you definitely loosen up. 
Um, yes. Kind of the, the more you do it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, I had a very similar experience in terms of working with another attorney here in town for about a year before opening up my office. Uh, and he did a general practice, uh, including criminal defense, which is where I really fell in love with criminal defense work. But it felt like very, you know, thrown into the fire model. And, you know, I mm -hmm. definitely think with some of the employees that have worked at our firm, that's kind of been the, you know, sink or, sink or swim has been the model. And I do think that that is a problematic model uh, most of the time in terms of just getting, um, you know, kind of like, how, you know, as, as a new attorney, like trying to find your, find your bearings, it's really difficult when it's like, you know, he, he, here's the situation, go, go figure it out. One of the things that I love about criminal defense, whether you're working at a firm um, with other lawyers or by yourself, is there is such a great community of people that what, you know, answer questions and kind of guide you along the right path. You know, I feel like I could probably sit down and talk with, five lawyers here in the local bar more in depth about a case than I could have with the, you know, my, my first employer, my first boss, you know, like, you know, that mm -hmm. just, uh, there's, there's more giving of time and energy and education. Um, so it's one of the things that makes the criminal defense bar really special to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. It doesn't hurt, you know, that I think defense attorneys like to uh, hear themselves talk to you, <laughs> ask about true. something, you know, they're going to give you like a, a 10 minute, you know, lesson on, yeah. on something. So uh, that, that definitely uh, doesn't hurt. Um, yeah. But it, yeah, yeah, in terms of that DA experience, what were some of the biggest takeaways? I think that there's a real advantage that, you know, former prosecutors have that come into private defense practice. Mm -hmm. So what were, what were some of the big lessons learned? Yeah. So I, I think one of the, the things I learned early on is I remember coming to the office and there was a guy who had started a little bit before me, but he had been a prosecutor for like 30 years. His name was Gene Morris, and he had worked in like Alamance County and did a lot of the murders and the sex cases. And in, uh, in Stanley County in district court, I was mainly in district court, but sometimes other prosecutors would be in there. So I remember I got to uh, the office kind of early and it was Gene's day to go in district court. He was going through all the files, you know, writing notes, doing all of this stuff. And I was like, what are you doing? It's just district court, you know? And uh, he was saying how he wanted to be prepared and like ask me questions about stuff where I like, you know, we just grab the docket, go in there. Um, so it's like, if this guy who's been doing this 25 or 30 years is getting this prepared for district court. Um, you know, that's definitely something I need to be, you know, I don't know anything. Yeah. So that's definitely something that, that I need to be doing. Um, and, and I try to carry that kind of as a criminal defense attorney. Um, you know, one, one important thing, um, you, you want to be prepared, but like even for traffic court, uh, know what you're going to ask for. You know, yes. I, I hear, <laughs> you know, some other attorneys like, you know, what do you want? You know, the prosecutor will say, well, what do you want on this? Well, what can you give me? Like kind of know, like, yeah, I want a PJC. Okay. Yeah. I can't get that. I'll take a nine over or, you know, so for each case, whether it's, you know, traffic court or a misdemeanor or felony, kind of know what you want to ask for. Right. Know what the, know what the biggest issue is for your client. Right. Is it uh, being on supervised probation, uh, you know, going to jail, um, you know, being able to travel out of the country? What is their biggest issue? Um, so that way you kind of know what to ask for. Um, I, I think that was a, a good takeaway also. And I assume uh, defense attorneys know this. Maybe they don't. A prosecutor doesn't want to be trying a DWI case either, you know. Yeah. It's like they would rather at three o'clock or four o'clock on a Friday, they would rather be driving home or, you know, doing work in their office. So it's not like they want to be trying a, a case, it, 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 you know, either. Um, so a lot of times, you know, not with DWIs, but other sort of cases, if you can come up with some solution that kind of, you know, gives them a win and gives your client a win, 
a lot of times they're going to go with that because it's not like even a, a, a basic DWI where they're just kind of reading off the questions and stuff. They don't want to be doing that. There, there, you know, tons of other things that they would rather be doing. Um, I think some some other stuff I, I learned as a prosecutor is um, kind of what defense the type of defense attorney I didn't want to be. Um, you know, I, I I'm a pretty uh, laid back guy. I like to joke around. Um, and that's kind of how I am as a defense attorney. You know, I'm not going in there, uh, being super aggressive, um, you know, hemming and hawing about having to try a case or the plea offer I got. Um, I've always found that, you know, you attract more bees with honey. So if you have a good relationship with the prosecutor, when they see you, the prosecutor is not like, great, this guy's coming up. Yeah, you know, exactly. I, I yes. feel like you get the same outcome as the more aggressive attorney or, or the attorney that might be considered kind of a jerk. Um, but, you know, I, I would say just be who you are. Don't, you know, if, if I came into court being super aggressive and uh, acting like that, it just wouldn't. I don't think it would work for me. Whereas, you know, some attorneys, it really works well for them. But I feel like a lot of times you'll get to the kind of same place you would if you acted the other way. And, and you know, when I was a prosecutor, the defense attorneys that had a good relationship, that were easy to work with, they probably did get a little bit better deals. You know, not like crazy, but, you know, I, I would just because they're so easy to deal with. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, being able to see the those different perspectives on attorneys, uh, you know, gave, gave me kind of a good idea of how I how I wanted to be. Yeah, I love um, that. I think it's really a cool thing about you know knowing what you're asking for, and that sounds so simple. But if you think about like a DA having to make, you know hundreds of kind of mm -hmm. uh, small decisions every day, you know, do we right. need to get this officer in court? Do we not? Um, you know, have you talked to this witness? Do I need a driving record for this case? Um, is this a continuance I'm going to pose? Is it not? What am I doing on this, on this case? I mean, there's just so many decisions that, you know, anything that can be offloaded is a huge weight relieved. So when you just yeah. come up very clearly and say, here's what I'm, here's what I'm shooting for and, and kind of give the, you know, rationale for that in a succinct fashion. I do think that that is something that, uh, I, I did poorly on for a long time was just, you know, I kind of felt like, you know, I need to know what the offer is going to be, go, you know, go, uh, maybe, maybe give a counter offer, go talk to my client about that and then come back. And I think that, you know, going forward with a very clear vision of here's what we're trying to do. And it's one of those things that I, I think a lot of times you just get surprised when a prosecutor's like, yeah, that sounds, sounds good to me. Let's, let's, you know, <laughs> let's get one more case off the counter. That's uh that's, that's yeah. all right. Let, you know, so I, I think that that, again, it's going to depend on the circumstances in every County, but I do think being very clear uh, about what you're asking for, especially on small cases. Don't, don't, I, I think my, my old mindset was I'm going to go in and see, you know, if maybe the DA's offer is like kind of better than what I was hoping for, or let them come to like the, you know, quote unquote, right conclusion on their own. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, they don't, I mean, they don't need to spend any more time on the case than is necessary. If they want to look at officer notes and get a driving history, great. Or if you already have that, you know, ready as part of your you know, uh, basis for request. Great. But yeah, you, you don't want to offload that weight onto the DA when they already have so much going on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and you know, after about three or four years working at the, well, probably around two or three years after working at the DA's office, um, you know, I was like, and part of it was, you know, the good defense attorneys make it look super easy, right? <laughs> they they, roll in with <laughs> they like, definitely you know, do. Their stack of traffic tickets, yeah. or like, you know, they got four DWIs on, you know, in a day, you're like, God, this looks, you know, super easy. Um, but once you start doing it, you know, you realize that it's not. But just seeing that, 
Um, and, you know, I wanted to make a little bit more money. Um, always kind of had that entrepreneurial spirit um, growing up, you know, cutting grass or, um, you know, doing, <laughs> I would do those, um, I don't know if they have them everywhere where you paint people's addresses. You know, you oh, do yeah. the white paint. Yeah, you know, we yeah, would yeah. Go and, and put up flyers all over neighborhoods. That's um, awesome. And go do, go do that sort of stuff. So I've always kind of had that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so, yeah, just um, – and, and it, it's funny. I, I don't know if you remember this, but one of the bigger – one of the, the reasons why I wanted to go and leave the DA's office – was do you remember, and they might still be doing them, the RFPs, request for proposals, where like they would, uh, for defense bar, the defense bar where they would like um, give certain um, defense attorneys like all the court appointed Oh, yeah, cases. yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't okay. realize that was the term for it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was something like that. And so they, they were going to, they said they were coming to Mecklenburg in like a year or so. And so I was like, I want to get in Mecklenburg and start working on that, you know, before it gets there. It never came to Mecklenburg. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I don't even, you know, do court reported cases anymore. But, you know, that was uh, the big, uh, the, the big reason why I wanted to leave. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, and yeah. When, when yeah, I did. That, so. stre that uh, steady stream is super nice at the beginning part of practice. So that definitely yeah. would be a, a powerful attractor. But yeah, yeah I, lo I love the entrepreneurial, like, aspect of it i think that there is something about um yeah i mean after after you know leaving uh the first firm that i worked at again it just there was there was there was too much discomfort in terms of like things that i was being asked to do and i I've, I've got a pretty like thick skin and i'm i'm mm -hmm. good to go like try to uh, get into new stuff but it was like a level of like, man, I'm going to get myself into real trouble if I, if I stay here and keep mm -hmm. practicing. And so, you know, for whatever reason, like when I transitioned into, um, private practice, it, I, you know, there was no thought of like, maybe I should go look for what, you know, to practice with another criminal defense lawyer in town. And it's kind of like strange, like looking back at that now as to like why I didn't just start submitting, job applications to other places. Mm -hmm. There was some things that were somewhat lined up. I worked on some marketing uh, pieces uh, for the criminal defense side of the firm that I was at before. So maybe there was just like a comfort level, but it is interesting, you know, hearing your exit into private practice. It's like, you know, at some point you just got to kind of like make that leap and see, see what it feels like. You know? <laughs> <It's> mm -hmm. just, <laughs> Yeah. And, and I did have like somewhat of a safety blanket. Um, the, and I don't think I've heard anybody on the podcast mention it, but they had um, document review. Uh, do yes. you remember? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so that was a, a, a big thing in Charlotte. Um, and, you know, at the time, and I assume it still exists, but at the time it paid 25 bucks an hour. Okay. Yeah. I had a so bunch knew, of bunch of friends from law school that did that. So, yeah. So I knew, you know, that was a thousand bucks a week at least, right? Yeah. I worked eight hours a day. And so I got on the court appointed list um, in Mecklenburg for misdemeanors and felonies. And my goal was always um, to handle serious, um, you know, felony cases at some point, um, you know, try to get on the, um, you know, practice federal, federal law get on the, the federal panel. Um, and so, you know, I'd go to document review. And it's funny, I still see tons of attorneys every day that I met doing document review. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Who have, you know, uh, gone, to, gone to do other things. But um, like, and I hope I don't embarrass her, but like Jennifer Chandler, yeah. who you yeah, had yeah. on a couple of weeks yep. ago, she was she was there doing you know document review with me and you know you'd be in there and your phone would ring and you it'd be a client you know you'd be talking to them in the whole way <laughs> that's um, awesome but it was a great way to kind of um, bridge the gap yeah that's huge um, I, I think and, anything and, that is bringing in like a steady source of income that you can mm -hmm. lean on as you're making that jump I think anybody that is considering making that jump or thinking about, you know, how would this work? It, it, it feels a lot less dangerous 
if you've got a steady source of income. So similarly, when I went out on my own, and maybe again, this could be like part of the reason why it was like, there was not even a consideration of like applying. Um, I worked with a local real estate attorney that I had interned with prior to law school as a independent contractor. I did like three closings a month mm -hmm. for rent. And then he would pay me additionally for like, you know, whatever it was, 50 bucks a closing for each additional closing that I did. And, you know, he was, you know, he didn't guarantee anything, but he's like, here's what you could kind of like expect in terms of additional closing is, and that was awesome. Cause it was just mm -hmm. such a, you know, there was no overhead. There was no, you know, uh, question about like being able to like make some sort of money doing that. So I just provided a lot of freedom. So I'd like that you, you mentioned that because again, I do think if you have some of those safety, blankets in in place that it just becomes a lot a lot less dangerous feeling donating plasma you know wh whatever it <laughs> yeah, takes, whatever it right? takes. <laughs> That's right. um but uh yeah so so i would you know the document re review was in downtown charlotte so i'd you know walk down to the courthouse half a mile handle whatever i had to handle walk back um, so yeah, it, it worked yeah, out uh, really good. Um, unfortunately, it, it's easy to kind of get stuck into that. So I did that for about two years. Um, you know, didn't uh, didn't advertise, didn't do anything to kind of move my practice forward. And one of the guys um, who I was doing documentary review with was like. Yeah, I sent out some mailers. Um, you know, the the company I use will give you a free week. Um, and so, you know, I gave that uh, gave that company a call, got my free week. The phone started ringing. And, you know, from that, I, I just, you know, kept on going. Um, and, and I remember the, the lady I sat beside, uh, she was an older attorney. She was like, yeah, I did those mailers. They, they never worked. <laughs> and I was like, I'm glad I didn't listen to her. <laughs> That's so funny. Be, it's funny so how everybody still... has a slightly different opinion on some of that stuff. You know, yeah. like I mean, it's it is it is interesting. And I think part of the reason for that is just honestly individual attorney opinion, but part mm -hmm. of it is it's totally different doing it in like this rural county versus this metropolitan county. Totally doing it different doing it for a DWI than a speeding ticket. So mm -hmm. like that you also just get this, you know, kind of uh, gambit of results that again, it's easy to just be like, oh, that didn't work or, you know, yes, it does. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it's both. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, like my advice would be, you know, try everything, yeah. you know, Google, I totally Apple, agree. Facebook, yeah. Uh, yeah. podcast, do it all and, and fail at a lot of it. You know, yes. figure out what doesn't work for you. Yes. Um, also, and I assume most people do this. I, I don't know. Keep track of stuff. Yes. You know, my, my assistant has a list, a list spreadsheet, county. Uh, is it a CR, IF, um, you know, drugs, whatever type of case? Um, did they sign up? You know, and, and so... Every month I can go through, you know, we're getting this many calls for this county. This yes. many, so, I mean, you know, what, what, is it a referral? Is it a previous client? Um, you have to keep track of that stuff. Um, and, and that's why, you know, assistants are great because you can offload the stuff that you either never did or that you hated to do. <laughs> yes. and, and they can do it for you. Um yeah, just to before piggyback on that before you jump into your next point, I think you know the I think there's this saying that what gets measured gets improved. And that's mm -hmm. totally been true at our office as well. Like it's keeping those, you know, analytics and that I'm so terrible at that. Like I, I stink at analytics and I stink at like tracking things. And mm -hmm. so there's other people at the office that are great at it. And it's one, you know, it's been like amazing to be like, I can't even believe we can get this information sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that that's one of the, I mean, if you are not tracking that type of information, like you're just talking about, you're just shooting blind with everything. I love the idea of try everything, you know, uh, the other, you know, another thing that comes to mind is throw, throw, throw it up on the wall and see what sticks. That's but you can only see what sticks if you're able to measure, 
you know, what you threw up there. So I, I think that that really, it's a, it's both. You got to, you know, try it all, but measure it so you can make sure you stick with the stuff that's actually making a difference on the bottom line. Yeah. And, and I don't know how many attorneys use all pay. That's like the, the payment thing yep, we do. Uh, that we use where you can put in the trust or the operating account. Um, but they have little tabs, you know, and I have tabs for each county. I have tabs for what kind of a, a offense it is. And when we make a payment, I mean, it's, you know, I can just do, you know, April 2023. How many Mecklenburg cases, you know, did we get? Yeah. You know, how much how much revenue did we generate? Like but before I came on here, I was just curious to see how how many um, previous clients had signed up uh, last month, you know, and 15 previous clients I could look up in like five seconds, you know. Um, so it's just great to, to do it. Um, so. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. I think that's so so killer. That's awesome. Yeah, um, but to, some advice um, I, I would give um, to anyone you know thinking about starting going out on their own. The earlier you can start, the better. It's not going to get easier uh, <laughs> the older so you get. You know, they, it, it's that's never so going to be a, a good time. Yeah. Um, you know, w when I started, I, I wasn't married didn't have any kids. I could, you know, work until eight o'clock at night, yes. you know, every night. And, and it wasn't an issue. Um, but once you start getting more responsibilities, it's going to be harder and harder um, totally to you know, make, that. make that leap. So I would say if, if you have the inkling to do it, go ahead and start now. Yeah. The, uh, the safety net required when you're you know, a single bachelor is very different uh -huh. than the safety net that you need. If you've got, you know, a wife and a, and a couple kids. It's a very different safety net. <laughs> I mean, so I think that that really is like such a huge advantage. There's like literally mm -hmm. nothing to lose at some stage of, of life. And I, yeah, I mean, I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Um, some other advice, you know, I, I would definitely go for the, the low hanging fruit, um, you know, traffic tickets, uh, obviously, um, you know, maybe drug cases, um, alcohol violations, uh, you know, that sort of stuff, but also kind of dial it into kind of the, the things maybe, um, that are less common, but still really easy to handle. And, and I think every County has those sorts of cases, like maybe, you know, Mecklenburg, uh, we have, you know, you get charged with bringing a gun through the airport, yes. right? Yeah. Probably doesn't, you know, doesn't happen a, a lot, but um, there's going to be less competition for those types of cases. Yes. A lot of times they can do a deferred prosecution. Um, you can charge, you know, a, a good amount for it. And, you know, you might only get one or two a year, but that's just something easy. You don't have to think about. Yes. Um, so kind of dial that sort of stuff in, you know, every County has that sort of stuff. Uh, it could be, you know, carrying a concealed weapon. They complete a gun safety class. It gets dismissed or, you know, um, hit and run. They bring in an insurance letter. You can get an unsafe movement. Every county has those kind of easy um, type cases that you know might not have as much as traffic tickets or other things, but it's just kind of consistent uh, payment, you know, through the year. And if you get enough of them, you know, those sorts of cases, it, it starts to add up. Um, so just, you know, whether you're sending out direct mailers or whether you have a website or, you know, on your website, a specific page dealing with gun charges um, or, you know, you have a, a podcast or, or a video, you know, a five minute thing talking about one of these things that's going to generate revenue year after year. Um, you know, it might not be a lot, but when you get, you know, five or 10 of those things, it, it really starts to, to add up. Yeah. And uh, I think you also start to develop a reputation if you're handling that kind of thing as well. So if you're somebody that is routinely handling, um, you know, the, uh, uh, carrying concealed weapon charges in the airport, mm -hmm. other people in the courthouse are going to recognize that. And maybe they have a friend that like asks them since they're, a you know, there's a bailiff that, you know, is a law enforcement and they've got a friend that's like, Hey, you know, 
this happened to me at the airport, uh -huh. forgot about it, you know, whatever it might be. And it's like, well, I know, I know Banks has got a lot of these kind of cases, you know, going on. Why don't you give him a call or another attorney is, is in that same space, uh, DA, whoever it might be. I think if you earn the, you know, kind of like space in that niche, again, as infrequent as it might be, it now becomes easier to get those type of cases over the long mm -hmm. term. So I love that. I love that strategy. Um, something else that I was thinking about, um, if you have not raised your prices in the past year, raise your prices. Everything has gotten more expensive. Um, over the years, every time I've raised my prices, it has not affected signups at all. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, I think about it when, whenever I have to call, you know, a, a plumber or a painter or whatever it is. Um, I'm never going to pick the cheapest. I, I don't care how good it sounds. It, you know, in the back of my head, I'm always like, he, he's got to be skimping. I think very something. few people think that way. I mean, especially, especially in the world where there is kind of like a court appointed realm, right? Like, and mm -hmm. again, this is not to say anything bad about public defenders because I, I know a lot of the best trial attorneys in any given county are public defenders. So this yeah, is not it, I, I, sorry, but I, I love it when people are like, yeah, I don't want a public defender. Yeah. I, I always like, tell people straight up. I'm like, you're crazy, dude. Like that's if the you qualify, get one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, they're better than probably half the attorneys, yeah. you know, yeah. here. Yeah. So yeah, hundred percent agree. And, uh, but, but I think that in a realm where there's, where that perception exists, you know, it, I think people then kind of then when they move into the private space already have that pre-built thing, like I'm going to get what I pay for if I'm having to go hire my own lawyer. So it's, it's almost like more true in, in the space that we are in than it is in a lot of service industries. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, it, it's so, it, it's so easy to, you know, the, um, the race to the bottom, you can always yes. go yeah. cheaper. I mean, and when, where does it stop? Yeah. You know, so um, definitely raise your prices and, and be sure to uh, quote prices accurately. If it's a DWI and, you know, it's a blood case, right? You're probably going to have to go to court a couple extra times because the blood hasn't come back. Or it's a you know DWI wreck case that 10 officers were there. You're going to have 10 body cams to, uh, to review, you know, kind of... When you're when you're quoting, you know, how many times am I am I going to have to go to court on this? Because um, as a solo, I mean, the the biggest issue you're going to have is your time. Yes, hundred percent. Right? So you want to be sure to to quote the fees uh, fees accurately. Um, I would say um, one of the things that's helped um, grow my DWI practice. Um, I would say, uh, number one, obviously your podcast, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but your, your, your podcast has definitely helped, but I would say uh, another huge thing and, and you recommended, I, I would have never known this without, uh, without listening to you, but, uh, Anthony Palacios, yes. uh, standardized field sobriety test, you know, uh, training. I, I mean, that's key for a couple of things. Number one, you learn a lot. Um, number two, it's kind of dedicated time where, and, and you could get the manual and look at it and have a rough idea of what you're supposed to be doing, but dedicating two days to doing that, most people aren't going to do that. There's no replacement for that. Yeah. And, yeah. and Anthony, uh, you know, provides great training. Um, and if you ever need to email him, I've emailed him once or twice, always, you know, yeah. responds back. Same. Uh, I've, I've probably emailed him 20 times over the years and he always mm -hmm. gets back, no charge. Like it's, you know, he can be hit and miss sometimes because he's uh -huh. going all over the country testifying, but he's, he's great. I know he just had a training in, uh, Alfreda this past weekend and, uh, Stephen Thomas, who's at the summit was down there. Two of our attorneys were down there. I mean, it's, <clears> it's <throat> something I hundred percent believe in. I like, I, I just yeah. think it's so important. I had a case uh, yesterday, DWI trial, and, and this was, um, lost the case, but uh, 
when she was doing her uh, HGN test. Um, and, and this was a lady that was an instructor. Um, when she did her, um, the uh, nystagmus at max deviation, they're supposed to hold, hold that, their finger there for four seconds. And on the video, she was counting, you know, one, two, three, four. And I was like, let me just pull out my phone and actually time it. And she was only holding it for three seconds. Yeah. So before we went in yeah. there, I was like, I want you to, you know, use my phone and time this. And she was like, it, to her credit, she was like, yeah, you're right. It's three seconds. I, I can't count that uh, against your client. Uh, and I never would have, you know, known any of that uh, if it wasn't for Anthony's uh, class. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I think that's a great way to handle it too, just from a strategy perspective. There's there's a lot of different ways to do that, but I recently had a similar uh, deal with an officer, and instead, like I could have put him on the stand and embarrassed him on the stand, and you know, like, gone through everything in front of the judge. But instead, I like pulled him outside. You know, was like, hey, I'm gonna. I just want to watch through the field sobriety test because this is part of like my objection mm -hmm. is the way that you did this watched it together. And he's like, yeah, I agree. And I was like, you know, uh, I, I'm going to argue this on the stand or you can talk to the DA and see whether they are going to bring this into evidence. But you know, that, that I'm just going to be op open with you about it. And I think he really appreciated that. I, you know, I think it's, you know, one of those things where so, sometimes you don't need to make your point in the, in the courtroom if it's helpful to <laughs> you. So. And, and I think it's also easier making the point when you're just sitting there with your computer computer right in front yes. of, you know, you and the officer instead of, you know, trying to play the video and have them, you know, do the time or, you know, what, whatever your issue is. Yeah, And you also, uh, you're not, you don't meet that resistance of like, I've got to stick to my story talking in front mm -hmm. of a judge while I'm under oath. It's like, we're here in yeah. a relaxed setting. Here's what my argument is. You can look at this on video. We don't have to, we don't have to walk through this in the courtroom if you know the state doesn't want to walk through it into the courtroom and yeah I, I think that there's much easier buy into that than being like backed up against a corner where it's like the case is on the line are you going to like admit this thing <laughs> it's like, yeah it, it, exactly I, I agree and i, I was going to ask you wh which way you thought uh it, it was better to do yeah um, i think but, sometimes it can in front of a jury sometimes it may be better to like just be be kind of rough in terms of like let's get all the nastiness out because the jury is like you know building in this but i think most of the time in front of a judge it's like they just don't care you know so yeah you get so few of those i got you moments that i yeah. love to like actually like be able to use one but uh because i mean it never happens like yeah. in, real, in real life um but for DWIs, uh, also, and unfortunately, I don't get to do this one as much, but when you're in court, listen to the other attorney's arguments. Yes. I mean, you will find stuff that you, stuff that will win you cases. You know, it, it, if, it, if it works for one attorney, most of the time it's going to work for you as well. Yes. And a lot of times these are, you know, attorneys that have been practicing uh, a lot longer and you know, are a lot more eloquent than I am. Yes. Um, but then I just, you know, steal their verbiage. Yeah. Which, <laughs> and, which they're not offended by at all, which yes. is so awesome. You know, it's like, they're happy to share that. So it's great. They, yeah. They, they love it when you're like, yeah, I used your argument. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Um, also for DWIs, I would say, uh, the school of government, uh, UNC School of Government, just go in the search bar and, you know, just put in DWIs. I mean, you're going to get stuff from 10 years ago uh, that, that's, you know, a, a lot of it's still going to be relevant today. Um, and, and again, in all seriousness, this podcast, I, I remember when I was doing my first um, refusal hearing and I, I talked to some attorneys and had a pretty good idea of, you know, read the statutes, had a pretty good idea of how it was going to go. But I listened to your um, podcast and it was like verbatim, you know, exactly how it went, you know? Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, pre I appreciate the plug. You, you will get your money under the table afterwards, Banks. Yeah. Thank and, you. and we also need to, <laughs> to, to talk about the guest fee. I, I didn't, that, that wasn't That's included right. in the video. I didn't know. Uh, I would say uh, another thing to kind of grow your practice as soon as possible, hire an assistant. Yes. I mean, that hands down is going to make you money uh, from the very beginning. 
Um, you, you know, I, I lucked out, got a great assistant who had, uh, she had worked for two other attorneys, had worked from the clerk's office. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like she knows more about stuff than I do. Yes. Right. Um, to that, and, to that know, point in terms of doing it quickly, you know, I, I think that it's, it's kind of similar to the idea of starting your own practice as early as mm -hmm. possible, because the sooner that you hire an assistant, you know, whether it's a great assistant and you, you, like you have, and you kind of luck out on that front, or it's somebody that's terrible and not a good fit or whatever it might be. And it's just like, this is not going to work out. Now you've learned that. And there's like a mm -hmm. kind of hiring lesson that has come from that, that, you know, I think, I think some people have that first bad experience and they're like, never again, but really it's like, no, that was the learning lesson. That was, you know, what you're, you, you know, kind of you, now, you, now you can, again, go back to the drawing board and kind of figure out how you need to refine the hiring process, but there's yeah. no playbook. So just go out and do it. And, and, and I would say even a, a crappy assistant's going to make you money. Yes, I 100% agree. Yes. I, I, a funny hiring story. First assistant um, I was going to hire, you know, sounded pretty good, uh, you know, liked her, got along with her. Um, I was like, you know, pretty much going to hire her. I was like, let me just, while I'm at the courthouse, I'll just put in her name. Like, embezzlement from it or like you know shows up as something she didn't convict on she's currently on supervised probation i'm like oh my god i almost hired this person uh and you know i was like i emailed her back yeah we're not gonna be able to hire you and she was like do you see my record and i was like yeah um but yeah get uh hire an assistant as soon as you can um i would say uh Re reviews are huge, um, especially nowadays. Yes. Um, if you do traffic or something that is high volume, ask for reviews every time. Um, when, when you send out that disposition email, um, you know, unless you miss their court date and they got like arrested, you know, <laughs> ask them for a review. Um, one of the things we have my assistant do is uh, if we send them a link to pay and they don't respond to email, my assistant calls them. And I, so when she does this follow up call, you know, after she says, you know, we sent you the link, she says, you know, we're a small business. Ho hope you enjoyed our services. Um, if you could leave us a review, that would really help. You know, uh, I, I can send you the, the email uh, right now. Yeah, that's um, great. And, and great I way of phrasing it. That helps. I've also seen, um, where attorneys will text. Yes, uh, we've started that doing that a little bit. After, we have a, a couple of attorneys that do it that way, and there's a seemingly better response rate to that. Yeah, uh, I, I would almost say, you know, even if you don't do traffic, do traffic so you can get all these reviews. You know? <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> um, and, and to somewhat piggyback on that, um, with tracking stuff, sort of, uh, you got to do follow ups. Yes. You know, whenever, whenever we're having like a slow day or so, a slow week, I'm like, Jody, come through the stack of, of, of cases, do the follow ups. It will always generate money. That's so uh, always. I mean, yeah. very rarely does she go through a stack and like no one wants to sign up. Yeah. You know, so if, if you're not doing uh, follow ups, I, I think you're, you're definitely uh, leaving, um, leaving some money on the table. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, so, um, real quick, um, one, yeah, no, I, I, I know, I know we're kind of on a little bit of yeah. like a, a deadline bank. So I yeah, appreciate very much, uh, you know, you, you coming on and, and I mean, that was such a great laundry list of ways to improve, but yeah, if there's any, any, uh, advice to leave the audience with, please, uh, please share. Yeah, I, I would say a couple of quick things. Um, I would say uh, Odyssey is not as bad um, as people think. Uh, there are things that, that stink about um, Odyssey, uh, you know, um, for traffic stuff, you know, no paper trails for stuff. Uh, I've had uh, stuff get messed up. You know, you go in there, continue a case, somehow a, a plea gets entered, uh, you know, tons of stuff. All stuff that can be cured with MARs. Uh, but at the at the beginning, kind of uh, 
you want to make sure you're getting the, the correct dispositions. At the beginnings, things will go a lot slower. Uh, biggest, my biggest issues with Odyssey or Oddity, I think somebody called it. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Getting uh, anything signed by a judge, uh, limited driving privilege, FTA strike, uh, MAR order, any of that, it's going to take a lot longer. So uh, be sure to, you know, tell clients that, um, you know, if somebody wants an FTA struck in like a day, that's probably that that's not going to happen. Yes. Uh, limited driving privileges kind of stink. Uh, a lot of times if they're found guilty of a DWI, um, they're not going to get that limited driving privilege signed that day. So ahead of time, I tell them, hey, go ahead and set up transportation uh, because, you know, you're, we're probably not getting that privilege today. Exactly. Um, but there are good things. Um, number one, uh, people call you, uh, to, you know, they don't know their speed. You can look it up. Uh, people, you know, don't know, uh, when their last conviction is, you can look it up. One of the, one of the biggest advantages is, um, and this might be specific to Mecklenburg. I don't know. Uh, you don't have to go in front of a judge to get a judgment on a traffic ticket. Yeah, okay? that is, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Prosecutor in or improper equipment, you get 40 days to pay that. They don't, you know, they don't get charged the, the $20. So that way they're not having to send the money to me for me to then pay it off. You know, yeah. we just send them a link. Um, and, you know, keeping track of the trust, paying that money, cutting the checks. I mean, all that time adds up. Yeah. And that's something that's that, something that, that we're kind of in the midst of trying to figure out right now how to make that, you know, basically take advantage of that. Cause it to me, like that's a humongous like weight lifted in, in it, terms of and time, I don't know so. if every yeah, I I don't know if every county will kind of do it where you get 40 free days. But I mean it's like a built-in payment plan. Yeah. 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 You know, that's huge. Which, which is something um something awesome. One one last thing. Um, and, you know, I would say in traffic court, Odyssey moves a little bit slower, but it hasn't completely changed, uh, changed my practice. Uh, in district court, you know, Mecklenburg always kind of ran a little slow. You know, uh, a DWI plea or, or conviction might take about 10 minutes where it took, you know, two minutes before. Yeah. Um, but 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 it's not horrible. Um one other advantage, you know, kind of thinking towards the future is, you know, there might be a point where if you're if you do practice in multiple counties, uh, instead of, you know, driving an hour to that other county, pick up the phone and say, hey, can we handle, you know, 10 tickets right now? Yeah. You know, look at, you look at your screen hops on their hops yeah. on their computer. Yeah. Uh, knocks out for you, you know, and you've saved, you know, three hours of, of travel time. So. Um, I, I think there there definitely will be some um, some advantages. Yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's partially the DA's office discovering how it can save them time, and once they do that, I think that the defense bar is really going to benefit from that because you know if you've got one DA that it's like, hey, we're just going to stick you in this room for you know a week and you're going to be like the, you know, defense liaison, like you're, you know, just going to be like, you know, obviously this doesn't work in a small County, but mm -hmm. you know, where there's a volume of cases, then you're just knocking stuff out. Whereas before you're having to waste multiple people's time and have people, yeah. come, you know, back and forth. I, yeah, hundred percent agree with that. So I love the takeaways and I love the positivity about it because it's kind of like, we got to deal with it. So there's no point in like, you know, push, uh, you know, I, again, I, I don't understand, I don't understand all the nuances of like lawsuits going on against title uh -huh. tech or all this stuff. Like, I, I don't understand it, but you know, I'm, I'm in the perspective of like, we've got to, I'm going to have to deal with it. I'm not going to be filing a lawsuit. So I might as well just go in and like <laughs> get it figured yeah, out. So <laughs> it, it, it's funny. Uh, um, I, I think everybody was like, you know, praying it, it wouldn't come yeah. you know it got delayed in Mecklenburg <laughs> and I was like okay this thing is not coming yeah you know and then it finally gets in you're like okay I, you know not now I now I have to uh have to deal with it but yeah I, I think uh and, and every county is going to handle it differently but um but yeah there there are definitely some advantages of it uh and it's not I, I mean I wish it was back to the old way but it's not you know I'm not going to be a tax attorney or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right.
<laughs> well, I, I love it, Banks. Thanks very much for for all the advice. I uh, yeah, really appreciate the the time this afternoon. Now, notice uh, you didn't say wisdom. Now it's oh, down to right. advice. <laughs> Soon it's gonna be like just suggestions. <laughs> yeah, th th thanks for for coming on. You know, like as the Harry Carey. You know the. <laughs> yeah, thanks for uh, showing up uh, today. Uh, no, it was that. Was, those are that was a uh, a gold mine of of bullet points there, Banks. So really appreciate it. Uh, well, I appreciate. It. Hope uh, hope uh, that this uh, helps somebody. Um, and it, if I can be of any service to anybody, um, I handle cases and. About eight counties, Mecklenburg, Union, Gaston, uh, Stanley, Montgomery, uh, Richmond, uh, Anson, uh, Scotland, and uh, Cabarrus County. So That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, give, give, give Banks a shout. Fun person to talk to. <laughs> and uh, I mean, build a connection. I mean, it's just, it's really, I think, important way for us to uh, kind of grow, grow together. I mean, that's just part, part of it. So, you know, I've, I've had several guests say something similar to that, and I don't know how many people have actually called them, but, um, call banks. If you, if you've got a, a case that you can work on together, or bounce an idea off of great, great person to talk to about it. So thank you again, banks. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Jake. Hope you have a good day. Yeah, you too.